we honor you. May our lives be a burnt offering, a sweet-smelling savor. May we be consumed by who you are in our spirit, our soul, and our body. We come and we place ourselves as that living sacrifice on your altar today. May we be consumed in who you are, Lord. You know, earlier this, you can be seated if you'd like. Earlier this morning, as I was getting ready to come to church, I was, found my thoughts on the story of Jacob when Jacob had manipulated his father and got the blessing and uh, and so forth and you know we always kind of pick on Jacob a little bit because of that but you know one thing about Jacob is he honored the things of God and his family more than Esau did Esau sold it all for a bowl of soup amen and that's why the scriptures say, and it uses the words loved and hated, but of course it's not God hating someone, but it's God had to choose. And he saw Jacob's heart, even though Jacob's ways were not necessarily right, his heart was. And so the blessing came. But you know, you can have a right heart and still be operating in the ways of man. And I think that's where we get in trouble as Christians a lot, is we have a right heart about things, but we, we're trying to do it for God. You know, we're trying to make things happen, or we're trying to push the agenda. And there is no place in the Bible that the Bible tells us to do anything for God. There's many places where it tells us he's going to do something for us if we'll let him. Paul had to learn that lesson. He said, I finally got it figured out. When I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. When Paul finally comes to the end of himself and just submits himself to the Father in the situation, just begins to worship and honor God in the situation, that's when we see God take, him, take us into something that we can't do on our own. Jacob ended up wrestling with God wrestling with God for something he already had. See, that's how messed up our mind can get. Finally, the, the angel, or some people believe it was Jesus, whatever, whoever it was, it was a representative of heaven, amen, and the kingdom said, what's your name? He had to ask him what his name was. He didn't even know who he was. See, until we, until we let God consume us with his wisdom, his knowledge, and his agenda, and just everything that's him, we're not even going to know who we are. We'll run around with a right heart, maybe, wanting to serve the Lord. You know, Paul had a right heart when he was Saul of Tarsus. He was wanting to serve God, but he was doing the wrong thing, putting Christians in jail and, and murdering them. Come on, are you here? And I'm sharing all this today because the Lord is... Right now, one of the main things he's doing, I know he's doing it in my life, I've heard my wife talk about it in her life, other people, is he's got to shift us into our real identity. He's got to shift us into our real identity. He's wanting us to become that vessel, that he, that not a vessel he can use some, but a vessel that he can use in the fullness. And I'm not talking about you being a perfect person, not making mistakes, not ever sinning again. That's all religious nonsense. Amen? I'm talking about you and I finding out who we are and who he is in us. And I'm telling you, until, unless you just bring yourself and lay yourself as a, and just say, God, take me apart and put me back together again. Well, Pastor, it just seems like I've, I, we're always doing that. Yeah, that's because we always need that. We're going to be growing and changing continually into the image of Jesus. But we're at a crucial point in history right now where God is going to accomplish certain things one way or another, and he's going to find out who Gideon's army really is. He's going to find out uh, what generation will cross Jordan and go over and take these things. And it's not going to be the people that have got it figured out in their heads and have been running in circles in the desert 
And just because God hasn't let them die in the desert, they think they're right where he wants them to be. He's saying, come and lay yourself before me. Now listen, I've had to do this more than once in my life. Come and bring him all you know, all you think you know, but you don't know, and all you don't know. And say, God, I lay it all before you. You can say anything to me you want to because I know you love me and I know you wouldn't correct me or show me even something where I've had a right heart but a wrong head. You can, you're going to do it all because of your love for me to bring me into the fullness of what you have for me. You know why this building's not full this morning? Because Christians are living out of their head. Your biggest problem in life is not the devil. It's your own head. It's you trying to figure this out in your head, and you can't. And, you know, we're, we're so hard-headed sometimes. We keep running into the same things, the same problems in life, and blaming it on other people when it's really us. <laughs> I'm not talking about persecution. You know, you're going to get persecuted if you live godly in Christ Jesus. I'm talking about trying to do what God's called you to do. If that pattern is there, it's not them, it's you. Somehow you are deceived in your mind, and you're trying to work it all out, and your intentions may be good, but God says it's time to get past just good intentions. It's time for me to bring you into balance, into fullness, into the place that I have for you. So Jacob, you are not Jacob, you're Israel, and you need to figure that out with me. You don't need to wrestle me for something. You don't need to keep wrestling for something that's already yours. But until you understand it and what it really is, you're going to be Jacob. And you'll run around trying to manipulate situations so that God's will can be done, and it'll never be done. I hope you understand where I'm coming from this morning. It's This is not a put-down. This is not a shame on you this is not a you know what's the matter with you type thing it's simply that god i i don't want to live my life with good intentions only i want the holy ghost to have control and your word tells me that he knows things that i can't even figure out your word tells me that he searches the deep things of god beyond my comprehension your word tells me in Ephesians 3, that he's going to do exceeding abundantly beyond what I can even ask or think. So I become that little child today. I become that little child, and I say, teach me, lead me, guide me, correct me, chasten me if you need to, because I know it's only for my own good. Let me see things from your perspective. See, when you have this kind of heart I'm talking about, all of a sudden, you're going to see things, understand things with the eyes of your understanding you didn't understand before. I know, because I've been through the process more than once. Hallelujah. This may not have been what you came to church to get this morning, but I'm going to tell you what, if you'll receive this, not take it and beat yourself up with it, but take it and say, Lord, is this something I need to do? Is this something I, I qualify for here? then you're going to see God do a work in you that's going to set you free. Father, I pray this morning. I pray, God, for all of us, myself included. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we just come before you, and instead of trying to pretend things are one way or ignore things that are true, we just become that consumed sacrifice. Holy Spirit, come. Do a work in us. Do a work in our brain. Do a work in our mind, our soul, our emotions, our intellect. Do a work in our spirit. Do a work in our body. Do a work in our life. We don't want to run around being Jacob when we can be Israel. Lord, I thank you that you're bringing your people into that place. I thank you that there's another veil that is removed and that the true light of your wisdom and understanding shines. We're tired of running in circles, Lord. We want to cross Jordan and go forward. And we thank you for it, Father. 
We thank you for it, Father. We humble ourselves before you, Father. And we thank you for it. We thank you because we know you're good and you love us. And you're going to work a work in us that will astound even our own minds because of who you are. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you need an offering envelope, lift your hands. You know, we're living in a season of reconciliation and uh, where God is making all things right. And, um, you know, reconciliation, uh, you know, once a month I reconcile the books uh, here at the church, and um, sometimes it's off a dollar or maybe even a penny. <laughs> and uh, you got to go back and you got to find what made your accounts not reconciled. And sometimes we've got to go back in our lives. We've got to let God take us back in our lives and bring about reconciliation so things balance. And see, that's what reconciliation is. It's a balance. Pastor was talking. You know, it's, it's God bringing us into balance. And, um, and according to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 20, it says this, that we, and I'm just paraphrasing it, we are God's voice of reconciliation in the earth. We are his voice. We are the ones who demand reconciliation in the earth. Uh, you know, I've gone back into my, into, into my family's history some and talked to some of my, the elders in my family and, um, and read some information. And, and I found that in, in 1635, my mom's family came here on a ship called Increase. They came, they came here. And... Um, and in going down through the history, I watched them increase as they came. They came as Irish immigrants. And if you know anything about history, Irish immigrants were, uh, were the scum of the earth, as far as the English were concerned, that were here. And uh, they wouldn't give them jobs. They uh, made them indentured uh, servants, slaves. Um, the, the wealthy northerners would, would pay the Irish $100 to go fight the Civil War for them. And um, uh, they, they weren't given jobs. They weren't allowed to live certain places. And, uh, but yet they came on a ship called Increase. And, and God has a way of causing your life to flourish regardless of what men say or do. Because you have a destiny in God. And that destiny is a destiny of increase. And as I've read through my history, I've realized that there were things that were owed to my family, things that were stolen from my family, that were never returned. And I am God's voice of reconciliation in the earth. You are God's voice of reconciliation in this earth. And you can make a demand on the earth to be reconciled in your life. And God knows how to put relationships back together. He knows how to bring you lands and houses and buildings and vehicles and whatever else was stolen from your family. He knows how to do that because he is the great reconciler. Amen. He knows how to balance the books. And over in Isaiah 49, you need to write this scripture down. You know, at least look at it if you're not writing your checks out. I try to give you a little time before I give you a scripture verse. Uh, but Isaiah 49, I'm reading now the Amplified. Isaiah 49, 25 says, Indeed, this is what the Lord says. you got to find out what God says about your life, not what Uncle Joe or, you know, Aunt Susie said. What Mama said, what Daddy said, what Grant. you got to find out what God says about your situation, about your life. And this is what God says. Even the captives of the mighty men will be taken away. The tyrant's spoil of war will be rescued. I, for I, God, will contend, contend, contend with your opponent. I will save your children. God knows how to set things right. 
I don't care how strong the devil thinks he is. I don't care how strong the demon's place have been given in your family's lineage or heritage. I don't care how strong, uh, you know, alcoholism or drug addiction or, or anger or fear or whatever your enemy, whatever that mighty man is in your life, there's a mightier person. And his name is God Almighty. And God says that where you've been held captive by a strong man, God will deliver you. God will take you away from them. And the tyrant's spoil, the one that has stolen from you, whether it's been joy or whatever it's been, finances, God says that he will rescue it. He will bring it. And he says, I will contend, contend with your opponent. I tell you, the devil don't have a chance against God. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And then the last one, I love it, I will save your children. God not only is able to restore things and situations to you, he's able to save your children. And when I read that this morning, in fact, I listened to Karen Wheaton preach on well, this is one of the scriptures. But if you get an opportunity to go, go to the website of Church of His Presence and, and, uh, and Karen Wheaton's message, I would suggest you listen to it if you can. You get, I'm going to get the CD because, I mean, this just fired me up this morning to realize that God knows how to save a generation. God knows how to reach in a generation, whether it's yours whether it's, you know, your, your generation or the generation uh, after you or the generation before you, God knows how to reach into that generation and save a generation. He knows how to save your natural children. He knows how to save your spiritual children. He knows how to save the children of your generation. He knows how to do it. I'm telling you, we're in a season of reconciliation. Whatever you need reconciled today, you are God's voice of reconciliation in this earth. And you've got to lift your voice and you've got to call that in. You've got to reach out there and call that in, in Jesus' name. And I'm telling you, whatever you have need of, whatever been stolen from you, whatever's been taken from you, what's ever been severed from you, God knows how to bring it back. But he's going to use your voice to do it. And you've got to hear what God says about the situation. Because you see, it's the voice of the Lord that has the power of reconciliation in it. So you hear what God says. If you don't know why, you don't, you know, you may not even know, need to know why it happened in your life. All you need to know is what God says about the situation. And he says he can redeem it. He says he can restore it. He says he can, he can make recompense. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, we serve a mighty God. But he's going to use our voice because we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Amen? Take your tithe and offering in your hand. Father, I thank you and I praise you today for the ministry of reconciliation. We call out into this earth and we say, come back in Jesus' name. We call to our children and we say, come back in Jesus' name. We call to our stolen finances and we say, come back in Jesus' name. We speak to our joy and we say, come back in Jesus' name. We speak to our peace and we say, come back in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you and praise you that you have caused us to be your ambassadors. You've caused us to be your agents of reconciliation in this earth. So Father, we declare and decree that the books are settled, that it balances in Jesus' name. And God, we thank you and praise you that because we give, it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto us. And we bless you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we thank you for the rains of heaven. We thank you, Father God, that they restore that that the enemy has parched. We thank you, Father God, that they refresh and renew that which has become dry. Father, we thank you for the rains of heaven that fall upon these people. And Father God, we thank you and we honor you, sir, in our giving today. 
And we thank you, Father God, that as we bring that we as we have brought this money into the kingdom of God, we say of it, it will never again go to hold men captive, but God, it will go to set men free. We thank you and praise you for the the ministry of reconciliation. And Father, we de- we declare restore in Jesus' name, and we give you praise and honor and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. You can be seated. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, there's good days ahead. Amen. Praise God. Just a few announcements before Pastor comes. June the 4th, uh, Gary Bat is going to be with us both a.m. and p.m., so make sure that you mark that down. Um, also, on June the 11th, not only will we have Communion Storehouse that day, but we want to recognize the graduates. We've got some, uh, Brother Frank graduated from college, hallelujah, and... Um, Praise God, we've got some uh, high school graduates and eighth grade graduates, and we've got some names, but I'm sure we've probably missed somebody. So if you've got anybody that's graduating in your family that attend here, uh, you've got a graduate from college, high school, or junior high, make sure that you get the names to us so we can recognize them that day and and have a uh, gift for them. Um, Also, Kids Camp is coming up less than a month. Hallelujah. So we want to encourage you that... uh, if your child is going to make sure you get your money in as soon as possible, uh, and if uh, you'd like to sponsor somebody, uh, that'd be great. Just let me know, write it on your envelope, or there's envelopes out in the entryway that you can take a numeral, um, a dollar amount, and uh, fill it out, uh, put your name and telephone number on it. It'll go in for a drawing. And I know they're also selling $5 raffle tickets for $100 worth of fireworks for 4th of July. So uh, there's all kinds of ways you can help sponsor a kid to go, and I know they're going to have a good time and come back changed. Amen, Pastor? Oh, don't forget the baby bottles, too. <laughs> yeah. They don't want you to take one home and suck on it. They want you to <laughs> fill it. Fellow full of money, right? I didn't have to say that, did I? But you know how I am. Pray for me. Praise God. Pray for your pastor. He needs it. He needs it. He prays for you, so you pray for him. Amen. Well, glory. Let's stand up for just a minute. You know what? Just just take a moment today. This is a Memorial Day weekend, and most people think about hot dogs and tri-tip, going somewhere, have a lot of up and down Christians on this weekend every year, they're either up at the lake or down at the beach, another lousy preacher joke, amen, I'm just kidding, but it's kind of, but uh, it's okay to take some time off and enjoy yourself, amen, but uh, this is a, a, a weekend where we honor and by the way, tomorrow morning at, is it 11 o'clock, Priscilla? 11 o'clock over at the uh, old courthouse park area over here. Priscilla's going to be singing the national anthem over there for the Memorial uh, Day service where we honor, amen, where we honor those who laid down their lives. Gave it all, you know. Amen. All gave some, some gave all. And so... Uh, if you can get a chance to come out there and just uh, honor, there'll be men that are there who have gone through war, men and women who've gone through war and have watched their friends die in battle. Yes. And uh, so just showing them that you really appreciate that and you appreciate the sacrifice that was made in some way, it'd be good to do that. But let's do that right now today. Let's just pray and ask the Lord to, uh, you know, to uh, bring before us the true cost of not only our freedom in Christ and his blood, his life that was given, but the lives that were given for our nation. Father, as we stand here today, most of us, if we've never been out of the, the boundaries of this nation, do not understand how blessed we really are. And Lord, I haven't been out much, but I've been out enough to see your hand upon this nation and the goodness that's upon this nation. And Lord, as we know, all of us know that there were people from the very uh, birth of this nation that, uh, whose lives were given so that we could have the freedom and the blessing and the prosperity and all that we enjoy, both spiritually and naturally. And Lord, I pray today for those whose lives were laid down, those whose lives were given, their families. We uh, have such a busy life that we just kind of tend to run through life and 
not realize that there are people who every day of their life, they're affected in some way by that loss. So we pray for them because we know this time of year is a time where those thoughts come back to them. They remember uh, when that one was taken by war or whatever the occasion was. And Lord, we pray right now for families. We pray for healing. We pray for strength. Lord, we pray, Father, for those who are still alive and they, they are experiencing uh, the trauma still in their minds of what it meant to see their friends die in battle or to be killed. God, let your healing love and virtue and power come to them as they uh, open their hearts to you. And Lord, we pray for those, even those younger families. My heart breaks when I see on television a young family whose the father or husband has gone on uh, because of war. And that family's left to grow up and to come into adulthood without that father figure or mother figure. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that your compassion, your love will come, that you'll activate the angels, you'll activate the body of Christ. And that, Lord, this will not just be another holiday that marks the beginning of summer, but it'll be a, a day, Father, where we honor those that have gone on on our behalf and that we all make sure that we are going to help those that are left behind and that we stand and stand solid for what they've provided for us as they've stood against tyranny and they've allowed us to live in a, a free nation. We thank you for it. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, Thank you for today. <clears throat> we open our hearts to you. We have already prayed and asked you to, to say what you need to say to us. God, I know that I'm just a human vessel. I pray that you'll hide me from my own opinions and words. They don't need to hear from me. They need to hear from you today. We all need to hear from you. And so, God, give us revelation. Let your words be said under the anointing that causes revelation in our hearts. And we make a decision to walk in the fullness of what you give us and reveal to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Turn and tell somebody happy Memorial Day. Before you're seated, praise God. Happy Memorial Day weekend to you, Glenn. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. Same to you. Were you? Yeah. That's good. That puts us in a position to hear, doesn't it? Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Well, everybody say it with me. The Lord is good. And His mercies are forever. The Bible says that his mercies are brand new every morning. Isn't that, that's cool. You get a new start every day. Yeah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I love that. Yeah. I love it. And I love it it's because it's a mercy start. Yeah. Amen. Mercy means he'll get involved and undo what the devil's tried to do. Yeah. So we're having a blessed day. This is a day of salvation. If you have your Bible, turn over to John chapter 16. We'll start over there. I want to just quickly bring out some scriptures here and then uh, go into something here that uh, the Lord just kind of dropped on me yesterday morning. Um, I want to talk this morning about living from heaven down toward earth. Or you could say it this way, living from the inside out. How many of you know Jesus said the kingdom of God comes not with observation. It's not out here in this you know, natural world where you can see it yet. The, the disciples and others were always trying to get Jesus to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and in Israel out there in the, in the natural realm. And he kept you know, resisting that because it wasn't time for him to do that. That day is coming quickly. Uh, we're in the last of the last days and the Bible says he's coming back and he's going to come back on that horse and he's going to come back and take names, you know what I'm saying, and do some other things. Right. And he's going to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. But that day hadn't come yet. He came first as the lamb to give his life so he could establish his kingdom on earth. And then he's coming back as the lion uh, one day to do that. But he did say the kingdom of God is not with observation. It's not out here. It's within you. 
Put your hand on your chest and say, it's in me. His kingdom's in me. Praise God. Amen. We're in the world, but not of the world. We are that ambassador Karen was talking about. An ambassador to a different nation is a citizen of the nation they're sent from. And even the, the grounds they live on is considered sovereign land of the nation they were sent from. Amen. Praise God. See, that's why you can tell the devil when he attacks you, you take your hands off of God's property. You thief, you liar. Amen. He has no legal right to encroach on God's territory. Come on, are you here? Amen. So the kingdom is in us. Now, what does that mean? That means that we have absolute victory. Here in, in John, we are going to start here. Just, I just want to read a scripture here in John chapter 16, where Jesus was starting to explain some of these things because he was about to go to the cross. He was about to leave the earth, and he was trying to transition them into kingdom thinking and understanding what this was going to be all about. So here in John chapter 16, look at verse 33. He says, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me, everybody say, in me. in me. Now, they didn't get that at the moment, but we get it. Why? Because we're in him. We're in him, in Christ. See, God doesn't identify you with anything or anyone but, he, but his son. He sees you in him, and he sees him in you, because that's true. The kingdom's in you. Christ in us the desire with expectation of glory. I'm going to live a glorious life on this earth and forever. Why? Because the one who is glorious lives in me. Greater is he that lives in me than he that's in the world. My total identification is not John Purcell fumbling, stumbling along in life, trying to figure it out. There's that part of me, there's that human side of me, and when I get in the flesh, that becomes a reality, a natural reality, and so forth. We're all, we have that human element but you're not to identify with that. You're to identify with who you are in Christ. And the more you yield to that, and the more you pursue that, and the more you let the Holy Spirit lead you in that, the, the better things are. That doesn't mean you won't get attacked by the devil. You will get attacked by the devil. But who cares if he attacks you if he can't ever win? Amen? So Jesus said these things I've spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Now, he's not just talking about, you know, the devil's beating your brains out and you're just, you know, right. somehow it's not affecting you. He's talking about you being in a place where when the storm comes up on the ocean in front of you and is trying to sink your boat, that you can stand up and say, I command you to shut down in Jesus' name. I release the peace of Jesus Christ into that situation. Amen. That's a whole other message, but we've talked about that before. But he says that you might have peace. In the world, you will have trouble, tribulation. The devil is going to stir things up. He is going to put pressure on your mind. He is going to mess with your life. He is going to have people say things to you and about you. He's even going to try to take control of your thoughts and deceive you into some kind of spiritual pride. And we've all let him do that. And we all probably have some of that in us right now. Thank you, Brother Mike. You and I are in agreement. Hallelujah. See, I, I want God to tell me where I'm messed up. I don't want to walk around with some kind of, being some kind of spiritual fathead thinking that I'm, you know, got it together. And if everybody would just listen to me, and anybody that comes against me, they're wrong and I'm right. That's a good way to waste your life. Amen. Now, my, my language might be kind of, you know, yeah, old school. Yeah. Can't, I have to be politically correct today. Sorry, not me. Let me get back to the scripture. Maybe I'll get out of trouble. In the world you may have or you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Look, I have overcome the world. I have overcome that demonic system that's going to work against you, work against your mind, work against your life, somehow try to deceive you, somehow try to get you off course, I, or defeat you. See, the devil can't come in. He doesn't have a legal right to come in and just defeat us, put us in a headlock and bring us down. He has to cause us to commit spiritual suicide. He has to deceive us into walking into his trap. And Jesus is saying right here, 
He said, I've got peace for you. I've got the, the you know, of course, Jesus would have used uh, <clears throat> the word shalom, which the word shalom means that you, it's actually almost a violent word. It's amazing that the word peace is a violent word. But what it means is, whatever's out of line, whatever's broken, you go in and you fix it so that everything is whole. It's like the scripture that says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That, that scripture's not saying just pray that there won't be any riots or there won't be you know, people being mar murdered. Or What it means is pray for the wholeness of Jerusalem. There's a wholeness that God wants to bring Jerusalem into. You can read about it in the book of Revelation. When the new Jerusalem comes down and, it's, and settles upon the earthly Jerusalem and there's a complete wholeness like it was before in the earth, before Adam and Eve sinned. So we're praying, actually praying for Jesus to return when we pray that over Jerusalem. So Jesus says right here, he says, I, wanna, I want you to have peace. He says, you're going to have some trouble. The enemy's going to come. But you can be of what? Good cheer. Good cheer. That's kind of like that scripture over in uh, James that says, count it all joy. Yes. When you fall into trouble. Mm -hmm. When you get in trouble, count it all joy. Why do you have to count it all joy? Because it's not joy. When I have a problem, when the situation looks scary, when the enemy's threatening in some way, and it looks like he's going to win, I don't, my response is not, oh, praise the Lord. I feel the spirit of fear. I get mad, frustrated. I know none of you do. You're just angels, right? But God says, look, look at it from my perspective. I've already won for you. You've got victory because you're in me. You start, when the enemy attacks you, you don't start out having to overcome him. I've already overcome him for you. You start out from a position of victory. He's just trying to bring you down from where you're already standing in victory. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 6 over there, to put on the armor, it says, having done all to stand, stand. Stand. Well, why? Because the enemies, he knows you're standing in victory, so he's going to assault you in some way. He's going to shoot flaming arrows. He's going to throw stuff at you. He's going to do what he does to try to get you to fall down from that victory. But if you'll just stand and use the sword, like the Lord told me recently, he said, keep wielding the sword. Keep wielding the sword. The Bible, the word sword over there in Ephesians chapter 6, that word sword is the word rhema in the Greek. And the rhema is not the, the reading or the, the revelation that we read in the pages of the word. The word rhema that means word, it is the speakings of God. God will put a word. If you'll open your mouth, he'll fill it. If you ask God, God, what do you say about what the devil said or what he's doing? God will put a rhema, a prophetic word in your mouth, and it's like a weapon in the spirit realm that will go out against what the enemy is doing. And the angels will hear God talking through you, and they'll come into activity. Things will begin to happen. Amen. And you may have to stand there for a while. The enemy, one thing I found out about him, it's like Brother Hagin used to say years ago, he is a persistent cuss. He'll come back and tell you the same lie 19,000 times. But you just keep telling him the same rhema word 19,000 times. You just keep sticking him with the sword. Every time he steps up close enough to get stuck, you stick him. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I've already preached myself happy. Hallelujah. <laughs> so Jesus establishes it right here. I've overcome. Now, because he's overcome, we've overcome. Let me see the hand of everybody that's received Christ as their Lord and Savior. You're born again. You're a winner. You're more than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. He conquered and he gave you the same position and inheritance he has. You're more than a conqueror. It's like that old illustration you know, about the boxer. He'd train, he'd work, he'd sweat, he'd go, he'd fight 12 rounds, get all beat up, black eye, bleeding everywhere, and win the fight. They'd give him the million-dollar check. He'd walk out of the ring and hand it to his wife. He was a conqueror, but his wife was more than a conqueror. <laughs> Amen. We're more than a conqueror. Man, he faced it all for us and won for us. 
He didn't have to win for him. He already had, he already had the victory. He walked around on this earth for three and a half years proving the devil didn't have any victory over him. Amen? Amen. But he, he gave us that victory because we are to identify with him in that victory. Real quick, turn over to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We need to get the word. You know, God wants to build his word into us. Because when you leave this place and all the praise and worship's not happening around you and the presence of God is not there and you go back out into that world and all of a sudden you step into a river of evil, you step into a flow, a negative flow in the world and demons show up and they start trying to talk to you, they start trying to do things in your life, you need to have that word built in you. You need to know what to do. The anointing will set you free, but the word of God will keep you free. Amen? Amen. Amen. 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse 4. You just said you were born of God. You were born again, right? For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Notice the qualification for overcoming the world. Oh, I have to live 30 years and try to be holy and try to figure it all out. No, that's called growing in Christ. That's called maturing. That's called letting God you know, perfect you and, and make you more into his image so that he can use you and he can, you can be what he, he called you to be in Christ fully. Paul talks, of, you know, and, and there, there's other scriptures that talk about new babes in Christ. It talks about fathers in Christ, young men, young, young adults in Christ. Amen. But it says, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. My trust, my belief in what Jesus has done for me and who he is in me has put me in a position. When you receive Jesus, you receive total victory over the world and anything that's world system, the God of this world would do to try to sh cut you short, stop you, you know, uh, uh, cause you to miss the destiny God has for you, you got complete and total victory over that. Now, see, what we, we tend to, as a human, we tend to do this. We tend to, you know, maybe we get up in the morning and all of a sudden, you know, uh, something happens to where it looks like we're going to go broke. Well, we tend to look at that as this, okay, now I'm here at zero. I'm going to have to fight my way back up into victory in that area. And God's saying, no, that's just a circumstance. You don't have any problems. All you've got is circumstances. I'm going to preach that over here. <laughs> Mike said amen a while ago. You don't have any problems. You've just got circumstances. It is no problem for the greater one that's in you to walk you right out of where you're at. He's your shepherd. And he said, even though you go through the valley of the overshadowing of death, don't even have to be afraid because I got my rod and my staff. And if you look it up in the original language, it means my power and my authority. And I'm your shepherd. My whole life is about watching over you as my sheep. You just keep following my voice. We'll walk right through this thing, out this circumstance, and we'll come into a place where there's some green pastures and some still waters. And goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you'll dwell in it, even in the house of the Lord, forever. See, when we start understanding that we don't have problems, we got circumstances. We got, you know, this is another opportunity for God to prove who he is. You know, back in 2007, when all that, and eight, when all that thing happened with the finances and the finances and the church went down, and we got to a place where we were having to believe God one week at a time to, to keep our head above water. Financially. Now, I didn't say a whole lot because I've learned over the years, you don't go out and start telling everybody everything before you found out, find out if God wants you to. Because sometimes even Christians, and I know they don't mean to do it, but they'll actually, be a, they'll actually fight you in the spirit with stuff like that. They'll start going around saying, did you hear that the church is having financial... The devil's going, yeah, keep saying it, keep saying it. So I'm not trying to hide something or, you know, pretend or whatever. It's just that I've learned to go to God. God, what do you want me to do with this? Sometimes, and a lot of times, he'll just say, just shut your mouth and let me handle it. 
You say about it what I tell you to say. Amen. Amen. And I go as much by what he doesn't tell me as what he does. If he's not telling me something, he doesn't need to. Right. Especially if I'm seeking him about it. Right. So you just keep on going. Yes. The devil will tell you not to do that. Your own mind will say, well, I got it, I got it, I got it. No, you don't. Just keep going. That's exactly. there you, go. right. you just keep going. Yep. Amen. Because you're already in victory. And I watched God through that time. I, you know, you heard our story twice during that from, from about 2007, 2008 to 2011. On the, ninth, or the 10th anniversary of, of 9-11 was when things changed in a drastic way because somebody walked in the door of the church that didn't even go here and gave us an eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 check. You could have shouted a little bit about that. Amen. And I didn't, I didn't call him and, brother, I'm, I'm, we're just having so much trouble down here. I refused to do that. I made a decision when I came here to pastor. I said, God, you're either going to pay for this or I'm going to do something else. If it's your will, it's going to be your bill. See, we go around and do our will and try to get him to pay the bill. That don't work. Make sure it's his will. Make sure you're doing what he's telling you to do. Amen? And so I just, I mean, I wasn't trying to be in God's face or whatever. I'm just saying, you know, you're either going to do this or you're not. I'm not going to play some kind of game here. If I've got to be a manipulator or some kind of person who's, you know, uh, putting out a prayer request. Well, anyway... I'm not saying you can't have people pray about things, but you know, there's a difference. You know what I'm saying. And so anyway, long story short, we went through that twice in that, that period of time. We came to the end of a week, no more offerings, no more anything for the month, and we were $3,000 short. Two different times that happened. Both times, without us telling anybody, somebody brought in three grand. Sovereignly brought it in. God had them bring it in and give it to us. To keep our head above water. And then on that day, he blessed us. Now, what that's done for me is that has established in me something, where, a faith where that's concerned that when the devil even tries to threaten me financially, I laugh at him. Yeah. 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 Wait a minute, devil, you got a short memory. Right. <laughs> Let me remind you about a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Praise God. See, we are living in a place of victory already. Lord. Glory to God. And that's what it says here in 1 John 5, 4. Now, turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. I've got to hurry along here. I always have good intentions about getting done earlier than I do. You don't have nowhere to go? I don't know. I'm looking around and some people have that look on their face. They do have somewhere to go. <laughs> Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Hallelujah. This is where Paul's revealing our standing in Christ. Let's start at verse 1. This is all good. And you hath he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our lifestyle or conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You used to have a different spiritual nature. When Jesus looked at those, those people and said, you're of your father the devil, he wasn't just trying to insult them. He was telling them, you've got a wrong nature in you, and you need to get it changed. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Verse 4, but God. Two of my favorite words in the Bible. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were separated from him, dead in sins, <clears throat> has made us alive or quickened us together with Christ, for by grace you're saved. See, when God raised Jesus from the dead, when the Father raised Jesus from the dead by the Holy Spirit, he, in his mind and heart he saw you being raised from the dead. He provided you the same thing. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, it gets better, verse 6, and has raised us up together and made us sit together 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not with Christ Jesus, not next to Christ Jesus. Years and years ago, I was studying this out and praying, and I had a little revelation that came to me, a little, one of those little, you know, inward revelations or visions or whatever, <clears throat> and I saw Jesus seated on the throne, as it says he is here, as king and, and lord of all, and I saw myself sit, sitting on his lap, my legs were where his legs were at, my arms were where his arms were at, on the, the throne, and then all of a sudden, I just disappeared into him, and you couldn't see him, see me anymore, you could just see him. Yeah. And the Lord said, this is the way I see you. This is, I don't see you outside of my son. I don't see you. I see you in him. I see everything that's about him is you. We're one in Christ. Amen. Now, I know as a corporate body, we all are different body parts, different things in the body, different anointings, different giftings, different abilities. We, we function as we, we stay. That's why it's so important that you find your spiritual connections with people. You don't do what you want to do. You do what God's telling you to do. If you go to the wrong church and you're trying to connect with the wrong people, it'll never work for you. But see, people choose churches based on, well, I like that church. I like, I like the music. Like one Christian comedian said, if you like the music, that must mean the preaching stinks. And he said, well, I like the preaching. Well, that must mean the music stinks, you know. That was a joke he made. Although it may be true, I don't know. But see, we start choosing things. Well, I like this, I like that. You know where God's going to make you go? Probably where you don't like. Because he's going to bring you there to bring you into discipline to something that's not in your life right now. And pastors and people in leadership in local churches, they, they have somewhat of a, like a, a spiritual parent type role. And that's why people a lot of times stop receiving from them. Just like when you're growing up and you get up to that age where you think you know a lot. And all of a sudden, well, dad don't know what I, you know, he's the old school generation. Amen. The older I get, the smarter my mom and dad get. I'm 65 years old and they're getting smarter all the time. Amen. But see, that's, that's what people do in churches. Amen. You know, I talked to ministers. Matter of fact, we were talking about this yesterday with some people. You, you get outside your church, it's easy for people to receive, for you to flow and bless people and minister to them. Because a lot of times, oh, that's Pastor John up there. I've heard that guy a thousand times. I hope he doesn't preach as long as he always does. God just shorten him up a little bit today. Would oh, I've heard that story a thousand times. Really? Have you heard it? Or did you just hear it. Maybe God keeps repeating it because you didn't get it. Amen. It's like Brother Hagin, that story he tells about that one deacon in a church where he would come by, there's a traveling minister, and he usually, on the way by, he'd preach one night in that church and move on, and he'd preach the same message in that church. God would tell him to preach the same message. He said, I got embarrassed after a while. God, they're going to think this is the only thing I know in the Bible. But he preached it like, I think, 11 times, 12 times, something like that. And he said, like on the 12th or 11th time he'd preached it, this deacon, this man in the church came up to him and said, you know, you've preached that sermon every time you've ministered in this church. He said, yeah, I know. And the guy said, you know, tonight I think I finally begin to see what you're saying. <laughs> we're not as bright as we think we are sometimes. Sometimes we're hearing certain things and we're interpreting it by our deceptions. When God's saying, that's not what I'm talking about. Let me give you ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Have you ever been in a church service? <clears throat> i got to get back on what I'm here on. But have you ever been in a church service where somebody's preaching along and it's like, okay, 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 okay. And all of a sudden they say one sentence or one phrase and it's like, bing. And you go, ooh. And all of a sudden you're not listening anymore. You're thumbing through your Bible trying to find other scriptures that connect with that. Because God's showing you something. He's giving you revelation. He's giving you a rhema revelation that's going to set you free. Praise God. Hallelujah. So it says here, we are seated, raised up, verse 6, made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. We are, people that sit are kings. They're ruling. They're reigning. 
Jesus is a king and a priest, according to the book of Hebrews, if you study it. After the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Jesus is our great high priest, but he's also king. And we are ruling and reigning over everything Jesus rules and reigns over. We have authority over. As Now listen, as an extension of him. You don't have it on your own. That's why you're like, when, you know, when he was on the earth, he didn't run and try to grab every blind person and heal them. He walked by the guy at the gate, beautiful, the whole time he was there and never ministered to him. Why? The Holy Spirit from heaven, the Father, the authority from heaven did not reveal to him to do something about that. Amen? Amen. There was another situation that was going to take place a few years later that was going to trigger a great move of God. So I'm not talking about running around and trying to fix everybody's life in your own you know, zeal without knowledge. But I am talking about understanding that God has given you dominion on the earth and he's, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you into situations, particularly if you'll ask him, if you'll say, give me an opportunity to minister to people. Give me an opportunity to lay hands on the sick. Give me an opportunity <clears throat> to lead someone to Christ. The Holy Spirit's going to set it up. The angels are going to manipulate the situation around because you've asked God for that. And you're going to be able, by the promptings of the Spirit, to minister to people. We make it too hard. You know, sometimes evangelists kind of have that, well, you know, bless God, if you're not winning somebody every day to Christ, what's wrong with you? Nothing wrong with me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give an, ex an answer for the hope that's within me, like the Bible says. Amen? But the calling on my life is more maintenance than it is bringing people in. That doesn't mean I don't do that. I have done that. Amen? But the emphasis on my life, every time I go down, sit down to pray and I try to catch a burden for the lost, it never happens. I mean, I've had times when God's had me pray for the lost. But you know, every time I sit down to pray and I open up, you know who I end up praying for? The church. You know why? That's what I'm called to. I'm called to help the church grow up and people be who they need to be in Christ. And when they're who they're supposed to be and everybody's in their place doing what they're supposed to be, then it all gets taken care of. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, I'm, I'm getting off track here a little bit. I want to stay with this. We've been raised up. We sit in a place of absolute dominion and victory. Look at Colossians chapter 3 real quickly. Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Say, I'm living from heaven down. I'm living from the inside out. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ. Well, we just read we were, right? If you're seated on that throne with Jesus, if you're in that place of dominion, if you're in that overcoming position in him that's overcome the world already, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection, <coughs> excuse me, set your affection. This word affection in the Greek means to think, to regard, to interest oneself. It means to exercise the mind. It says, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. Why? Verse 3, for you are dead. You don't exist anymore. As to who you were before you got saved, you're that, before you were that new creature. And your life is hid with Christ in God. So what he's saying here is develop a mindset of focusing on the kingdom and what's happening in the kingdom of God and who you are and what does heaven say about this. See, one good way to do that is when you're thinking about something, maybe you're worrying about something a little bit or something happens, you know, that uh, is not good or whatever, is to just stop and say, Father, what do you say about that? Yeah. Holy Spirit, what do you say about that? Yeah. What are you doing? You're setting your, thing, your, your mind on things above where you are seated and hid in Christ. Yeah. You're, you're connecting with headquarters. You're, you're living from in here out, not, oh my God, what are we going to do now? Right. Out here in. Right. 
You're, you're stepping into or you're, you're taking your place in that position of victory. And let me tell you something about when God speaks, when he reveals something to you, when he speaks to you, when you get a rhema word. You know, it's, it's like you've heard me tell that story of how the enemy was attacking my mind, telling me I was going to die young. And there was just this assault that was coming against my mind and all this. And I stopped one day on the sidewalk and I said, God, what do you say about that? And, he's, and I, he quoted a scripture to me. It was no longer just a, 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 an ink scripture written on paper. He spoke that scripture as a rhema to me. It was a creative word that came to me in power and strength. It was a sword put in my mouth to use against the enemy and his lies. And he said to me out of Psalm 91, With long life will I satisfy you and show you my salvation. Yeah. So whatever he'll have to do to give me a long life, in salvation, working salvation in my body, my soul, or my spirit to give me a long life to finish my course, that's the way it is. And so I've got that sword. It's right here, hit under my coat. And the devil will come, he has. Well, what do you think that pain was? Maybe you have cancer. He ever tell you anything like that? Well, you know, uh, remember your aunt died of a aneurysm and you've got a pretty bad headache right now when he tries that stuff on me immediately I stop with long life he will satisfy me and show me his salvation well I don't know what God said about my situation ask him ask him you have not because you ask not what do you say? What's your opinion, Lord? See, that's what he's saying here in Colossians. Learn to live up there in your head. Not down here in your head. Learn to have the mind of Christ. Let your soul connect with your spirit by the Holy Spirit and hear what heaven is saying. Living in that victory. See, the enemy wants to trick you into pulling you down from that, that position of victory and make you think you've got to you know, rub your knuckles raw trying to climb back up and get the victory in this somehow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, real quickly, turn with me to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. I always keep saying real quickly, don't I? You can do it slow if you want to, but I'm going to try to do it quickly. Now, the life of Peter. Think about Peter for a minute. Peter, we always, you know, you look at Peter and we see Peter. Peter was a type A personality. No doubt about it. He, you know, the type A personalities are great because they're good leaders. They don't let grass grow under their feet. Amen. They're ready to get on with the program. They're, they're the kind that's going to lead you into the charge against the enemy. But just like any, any of the personalities, it, when it's out of balance, it can be a, a negative thing. And the bad side of a type A personality is they tend to be the kind of people that sometimes leap before they look. Amen? Yeah. To leap before they look. You know, the, I heard it said this way one time. They're, they're part, sometimes part of the ready, fire, aim company. <laughs> Run out and do something. They go, wait a minute, maybe I should have checked with God about this. <laughs> well, Peter was a little bit that way, wasn't he? And I, I'm, I'm glad, I mean, he was, he was a go-getter. He was the guy that was, he was ready to go, man. He told Jesus, I'll stand with you. And he meant it. He pulled the sword out and tried to in Gethsemane. But here in Matthew 16 is where Peter got this tremendous revelation. Verse 13 says, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? What kind of revelation do you have about me? Who am I in your eyes? Right. See, who is Jesus in your eyes? And they said, excuse me, uh, verse 15, verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, of course he did. He's going to answer first. He's a type A, right? <laughs> he didn't say, uh, would you brethren like to have your opinion first? <laughs> Simon, <laughs> Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. You're that one we've been waiting on to show up and take over. Amen. To bring the kingdom of God. The son of the living God. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. 
And Jesus answered and said unto him, Peter, you are blessed. Now the word blessed here means you're flowing with God. You're hearing from God. You're not cooking this up in your mind. It's not your opinion. You're flowing with God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Simon, son of Jonah. Simon, that word, the word Simon means hearer and obeyer. The word Jonah means dove. It's really kind of a little hidden thing there. He was, he was hearing and obeying the Holy Spirit here, the dove. For flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father in heaven. It's revelation knowledge come to you by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and I say unto you that you are Peter. You're a rock. And upon this rock, not the rock Peter the man, because God can't build his kingdom or his church on a man. He has to build it on the revelation of his word. The man Jesus, the God man, he can build it on. Amen. Upon this rock I'll build my uh, church, which really the word church there is ecclesia, which, you know, we think of church as a building like this, but ecclesia is a group of people uh, in, the Roman, in Roman days when the Roman Empire was in power, the, when, the Rome, when Rome would take over an area of the world, they would get a group of people from Rome, an ecclesia, they called them, and they would send them into that place where they had taken over, and they were there not only to make sure that there wasn't an uprising against Rome, but they were there to, to shift the culture into Roman culture. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to go make disciples of nations. We're to shift the culture of nations into Christian culture. We're salt and light. We have that kind of power, that kind of authority. Amen? So he says, I'm going to build my ecclesia on this revelation that you've had. Praise God. And, it's, and it says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to give you keys to access all that's in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, just put yourself in Peter's shoes here for a minute. He doesn't understand the full thing about the cross and the gospel and the kingdom of God being in us. He's still in that mindset of, you know, Jesus, one of these days, he's going to rise up, kick the Romans out of the land, and set up shop here. Right. Yeah. Amen? So he was right in his heart, but he, his, his head was still wrong. You know, Jesus uh, said, Peter, you're, you're a rock, you're solid. He says that the church, the ecclesia, but built on the rock of this revelation. Hell's gates won't even be able to prevail against this revelation you have and what's in your life. You're going to have the keys to the kingdom to open and shut and to bind and to loose. Yeah. Now put yourself in Peter's shoes if God, Jesus had said that to you. You think that might go to your head just a little bit? Huh? If the King Messiah said all that about you? Of course it would. Amen? So that helps me understand a little bit why Peter was the way he was after this. You know, right after this, Jesus started talking about, I've got to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to die, they're going to, you know, they're going to crucify me, I'm going to be right. And Peter goes, oh, no, 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 wait a minute, hold the bus, Jesus. No, think of yourself. What are you talking about? Right. See, this revelation he got here, that, that revelation about the cross didn't connect in his mind with this revelation. Yeah. And Jesus turned to him, and he didn't call him the devil. You know, use the word Satan, which Satan just means adversary. Right. He said, Peter, you're an adversary. You're, you, you, because he didn't have the spiritual revelation of the cross, he was actually moving in the ways of man to fight against what was going to produce this in Peter's life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so Peter had this revelation. Well, you know the story how, uh, you know, they, they came to the place where it was time for him to be crucified. And, uh, you know, Jesus kept, just kept telling them, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. And the Bible says they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. And Peter, you know, said, Lord, I'll never deny you. And Jesus says, Peter, before the cock crows three times tomorrow, you'll deny me three times. Or crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter didn't believe that. I know he didn't because of the way he acted. So they get in Gethsemane. The soldiers come. Peter pulls out a sword and takes a swing at a guy's head. He must not have been a very good swordsman because all he got was his ear. Cut his ear off. Jesus told him, put the sword away, heal the guy's ear, and then he let them put him in chains and take him off. 
That blew Peter's mind. You know the rest of the story about Peter. But the point is this. Peter, when he heard these things we're reading right here, about all of this blessing and all this stuff, he began to live in a place of victory in his mind. Even though it was <clears throat> mistranslated about certain events that were going to happen in the future, <clears throat> he picked on it, uh, up on it enough to believe that he could grab a sword and go, and that God would back him up, and this thing would come out different than what it looked like it was going to come out, and it did come out. Yes. You see the point I'm making? Yes. Is that at least Peter, you know, makes me wonder if the reason he jumped up on the edge of that boat when they were out in the storm, and he said to Jesus, hey, if it's really you, tell me to come. In other words, what realm you're walking in, I can walk in there. See, he got the victory thing. He got the thing. He understood. Jesus is telling me, we win. <clears throat> Jesus is telling me we overcome. Jesus is telling me we bind and loose. Yes. Right. Hallelujah. Yes. Even though the timing was off for it, Peter had the right mindset. Now, of course, he got discouraged, disillusioned. You know, if you read the last chapter of John, you see where he was struggling. The devil was telling him that he was the one that not just denied Jesus. We've all denied Jesus. There's been times when we haven't let Jesus use us the way he wants to. We've denied him. Is that right? But that's not what Judas did. Judas, Judas sold him out on purpose. Amen? Judas purposely did what he did. Peter did what he did under pressure in ignorance and in struggle. And in pressure. Amen? Amen? And so Jesus helped him, you know, set him free from that. He said, go feed my sheep. Keep doing your ministry. Get out there. Go ahead. Move forward. It's all over with. Forgiven. Under the blood. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yes. Praise God. So <clears throat> even in this situation, Peter connected with victory. Enough victory to step out of a boat and walk on water for a while. Now, when he stopped and he started thinking, you know, because the Bible says that the wind and wave machine got turned up when he got out there. You ever have the devil turn the wind and wave machine up on you when you get out there? You're walking out in a realm with Jesus that you know you can't walk in. And the devil goes, well, I'll just scare you back in the boat or sink you one or the other. And sometimes he's succeeded, hasn't he? I'll just admit he has in my life at times. But Peter got enough victory in his mind, at least he stepped out of the boat. Everybody else was in a sinking boat and thought they were safe. Right. Moving right along since that went over real big. Okay, one last scripture. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12 and we'll close. Hebrews chapter 12. What are we talking about here? We're talking about living from a, a position of victory. Living from the kingdom out. <clears throat> Not trying to obtain something that's already been given to us. Now, you will have to fight the good fight of faith against circumstance. You will have to fight the good fight of faith against the devil's lies. You will have to stand. If, if you're praying for somebody and the enemy's captured their mind and he's running them in a circle and doing what he's doing, when you step up and you take authority over him and you break his power over their life and you become that intercessor, you become that one that's making up the gap, you know, the, the break in the hedge where the enemy's getting in, you step into that place, you're going to have to stand there. And I mean the devil's going to do everything he can to make it seem like what you're saying and believing and standing on and what God God has said to you about it, it's not going to work, but I got news for you. If God said it, it, it's impossible for it not to work. He told me years ago, he said, one reason I give you prophetic words ahead of time before a negative situation takes place is because I don't want you to be miserable during the process. I want to give you the answer. He gives us the end from the beginning. I want you to have that so that as you go through the process, the pressure's there. You already know how it's going to come out. Amen. Hebrews 12, <clears throat> Hebrews 12, verse 18 says, For you are not come unto mount, the mount that might be touched and burned with fire, nor blackness, nor darkness, or tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they heard entreated that the word should not be spoken unto them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. If so much as a beast touched the mountain, it should be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses even said, I exceedingly fear and quake. What's he talking about? He's talking about Mount Sinai. 
He's talking about where God met with them on an earthly mountain in Moses' day to give them the law, to, to give them both the law and the sacrificial system. God is so good. He gives them the law. He knows they're not going to keep it. They can't. It's impossible for them to keep that law. But he gave them a way out when they couldn't keep it. He gave them the sacri- sacrificial system that they could go and make sacrifice from a sincere heart and the blood would cover, God's grace and mercy would cover their inability to keep the law. But this was a earthly mountain. It was a place on earth where God met them. Right? It says, we haven't come. Verse 18, you are not come unto that mountain. But look down at verse 22. But you, New Testament Christian, who have the kingdom of God in you, you are come unto, and that word means to approach is unto location, you are come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So he's saying, spiritually, you have access and you are actually in. See, we have trouble understanding spiritual things because we try to frame it in time and space thinking, and that's not the way it is. There's never going to be a tomorrow in the spirit realm. It's always a right now. Your grandma that died 50 years ago, she's not sitting up there going, is my watch still working? I wish they'd hurry up and get up here. She'll be there and just turn around and you're there. It's hard for our brain to understand that, but that's the way it is. It's hard to understand that I can stand right here in my body and my spirit can be right before the throne of God in heaven right now. Because his kingdom is limitless. Come on, are you here? Praise God. You are come unto, now here's, here's where we stand. Here's our standing. Here's our place of victory. You are come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. You got so many angels, access to angels to help you, you can't even count them all. I was down in Fresno yesterday at a meeting down there. We were on the property of a certain church down there. And God just during worship, God made me aware of that church and that building and that land and the people that had established it and that God had used to establish that church and how that, you know, that it was his property and that he was wanting to use it for his purposes in the future and so forth and so on. And he just began to reveal to me that... uh, Part of the reason I was there and some of the people that were with me were there was to put our feet on this and claim it for him for the end time purposes he had. And when I did that, I saw in my spirit, I didn't have an open vision out here, but in my spirit, I saw a horde of angels come just right down onto that property. Oh, well, pastor, you're just imagining that. You know, you're right. I did see that in my imagination. But I wasn't sitting there trying to cook up some little Holy Ghost dream or something, you know. Pretend things were a certain way. That came out of left field to me. I wasn't planning on being there to claim some property for God. Come on, are you here? That's a whole different thing. Innumerable company of angels. You've always got the devil outnumbered. Just like Elisha and his servant, when the army surrounded them and the servant goes, what are we going to do? He said, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see what's going on in the spirit. And the horses and chariots of fire that were with Elijah before they were with Elisha were there protecting, watching, ready to go if they were needed. Praise God. Verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn. The general assembly, amen. A general assembly is a gathering place. They all gather in heaven. When they leave their earthly body, they gather in heaven. Amen. The general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. See, some of us are still on earth here, but we have access to that meeting. Come on. Just like you can watch the Internet and be a part of the meeting here without being here physically. Our spirit man can be a part of what's going on up there without having to be there physically. Because there's no limit. There's no limit between us. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. The general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, the Father seated on his throne. He is the supreme court. The supreme, supreme court. 
And we can come before him as a judge. And we can ask him based on what Jesus has done to make a judgment call and a ruling concerning us or concerning people we're praying for. And he will make the right call. Amen. Amen. And to the spirits of just man or men or mankind is what the word is there. To the spirits of just mankind made perfect or uh, consecrated or fulfilled or finished. Everybody that's known Jesus that has died and moved on, they're all up there and they're called a great cloud of witnesses. They're in the court of heaven with the judge, God being the judge of heaven, <clears throat> and they are testifying of their spiritual lineage. You got relatives up there that are testifying before God about who you are and what you're to do while you're on this earth and what you're to finish on this earth. When the devil shows up, like in the book of Job, and he tries to become the prosecuting attorney in your life and point, point out all of your faults and failures and all that, you've got people up there testifying about your spiritual lineage. Amen. And you and I can go up before him. Amen. We can take the devil to court and sue him. That's true. Amen. Amen. We've got the law book right here. We know it to, me, to us, this is a book of freedom and deliverance and blessing to the devil. The Bible says in Psalm 149, to the devil, the enemies of God, it's the judgment written. Yes. What did Jesus do when the enemy attacked him <coughs> in the wilderness? It is written. He brought out the judgment before his father and he decreed. It is written. He sued the devil. And his temptation came to nothing. Hallelujah. Quit attacking people that you're praying for, gossiping about them, putting them down, saying, oh, it's getting worse. Go sue the devil that's attacking their life. Go after the perpetrator. Amen. Verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Hallelujah. Jesus is your defense attorney. Now, you ain't never had a defense attorney like Jesus. And he's a lot cheaper than the ones on earth, too. He's there. The Bible says he can be touched with the feelings of your inadequacies and your weaknesses. And he's there on your behalf to intervene for you. And to the blood of sprinkling, to the blood of sprinkling, which speaks, that word speaketh there, in the Greek it's a word, it means a continual speaking. Think about this. The Father's sitting on the throne. Jesus is there as your defense attorney. The devil's over here, blab, 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 blab. But the blood on the mercy seat, now don't think of it as blood. Think of it as life. The DNA of God, the life of God. In him was life. When you talked about Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The life of God, the blood of Jesus is speaking the things that were accomplished through that blood being shed. He, he bled seven times, which is a number of perfect completion. He paid the price for everything naturally, spiritually, you name it. If we had time, I could take you through the scripture and show you where he bled, bled forever. He paid the price. The blood, the life of God is there on the mercy seat, speaking to the Father, telling the Father that's been paid for, that's been accomplished. You to have mercy on them because of that. See, it's the mercy seat it's on. Mercy now has come. Not judgment, throw them into hell, get rid of them. Now you can have mercy. When they come to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in the time of need, that's the judgment that's to be rendered. Amen. Now, if you're going to make yourself the enemy of God and you're not going to receive his mercy and you're going to fight against him, you will go to hell. Yeah. But he didn't send you there. You refused to go to heaven. Right. We've got to tell that side of it. There's some people that are confusing that. Well, God loves everybody. Of course he loves everybody. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. But he loved them so much he made a way out. He gave you a free will, and if you use that free will to be his enemy, there's nothing he can do about it. Right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Right. Well, he, he's just a mean God. No, he's not. You're stupid for going to hell. That <laughs> may be kind of crude, but it's true. You know, you're in a house that's burning down and somebody knocks a hole in the wall and says, come on, get out of there. You go, I don't want to do that. I want to go through the door. 
The door's on fire. Come on. Hallelujah. Now look at verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not that refused him that spake on earth, much more, he's talking about when Moses was there and so forth, uh, under the old law, M much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. He's speaking to us. He's leading us. If we're kingdom-minded, if we start from the place of victory, if we're, you know, it's like when I come in here, I come in here and I shut my eyes and in my imagination and from my heart, I go before the throne. I worship God. I minister to him. I don't just sing songs. I worship him. I connect with him. I'm as much in heaven as I am here on earth. I'm not saying I'm having some big, you know, visionary uh, trance type experience or something. I'm just saying I've learned to start in here and go there. And then when, you know, when, when you, you're affected by what's there, then you come back here and things happen. Yes. We're always trying to get him to come down here. He's saying, if you'll come up here and let me get on you and you go back down there, things will happen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Right. Praise God. Hallelujah. First John chapter 4, verse 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Them who? Them that are under the influence of the spirit of Antichrist in this world that's working to try to stop and defeat God, which is a joke. Have overcome them because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Glory to God. We have the victory. We're living in the victory. It takes time for the manifestation of victory to come from the spirit realm and play out into the natural realm. But we must always stay and refuse to move from that place of victory. We got to take a position. You know, the stock market guys, they talk about you're looking at the market and try to read the trends. Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? What stock's going to be hot? What's going to be cold? And they'll, they'll say, okay, here's what I think is going to happen. So they take a position. They buy stock. I'm, I'm gambling, basically, on the fact that this stock is going to do this. Well, it's not a gamble with Jesus. But you've got to take a position. You've got to stand in that place, glory to God. And worship him and thank him. And when the devil's beating your mind up, when every circumstance in the world looks like what God has said is not true or his word's not true or this is not going to happen or that's not going to happen, if you just look at the devil in the eye and tell him, I'm not moving, you are. I'm not moving, you are. When he attacks your mind, don't just sit there and go, Ugh. Amen. Get mad when he attacks your mind. Lying thoughts. Jesus said, cast him out, run him off. Pull down vain imaginations. Just chill. I'm going to have a praise party until my whole truck cab fills up with the glory of God. Or my house fills. I'm going to fight back. I'm not going to, you know, oh, well, I guess maybe the devil is starting to win. Hallelujah. Amen. Did this help you today? Hey, well, if it didn't help you, it helped me. I can tell you Hallelujah. that. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Praise God. I have um, a, healing, a healing word of knowledge. Um, uh, anybody in here in this place, maybe more than one person or maybe even online, um, have a tumor or a growth right now, like in your body right now? A tumor or like a growth or some kind of mass? I heard the word tumor is what I heard. You, you do personally? Okay, come on up here. Um, let me let me let me let me put it this way. Okay, Holly, what? On where? Is that close to your rib cage? Okay, because I heard rib, I heard it's close to the rib cage too. So I heard that earlier. So I, I'd be running up here if I was you. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then if there's anybody online, CJ, just let me know about, about tumor uh, growth or anything like that. And then I heard the word, um, this means anything to anybody, I heard the word Levine. Levine. I don't know if that means anything to anybody. I don't even know what that is, but it could be a last name or 
a first name or a city or something. I don't know. Levine. So if Levine registers, just come up here and let me know. Levine. Levine. Okay. So you can actually feel that right now. Oh, right there. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for it right now. Command you to go in Jesus' name. Command you to dissolve up and come to nothing in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus, you're the healer. You're the healer, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I command this thing to go from Shukubra Basa Kante. Command this thing to go right now from Pat's body now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy God. You're so good, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We thank you that you're the healer in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we curse you. We command you to go now in the name of Jesus. And I'll say it again, you'll come to nothing yes. this day forward in the name of Jesus. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. That thing will get smaller. It will get smaller in Jesus' name. For Pat. Okay, for Pat. for Pat. The it, Lord says, the things that I have spoken to you are very true. And those are things, says the Lord, that I'm going to begin to do. So step up and stand up and take your place. And you're going to find I'm going to flow through you through my amazing grace. The glory of the Lord shall come out of your mouth. It'll come out in a whisper and it'll come out in a shout. It'll come out, says the Lord, and flow out like a river from above. And people will be touched and blessed by my love. So just take your place and enter on in, and you will be a blessing to many, and they'll be delivered from sin. Thank you, Father. That prophetic prayer anointing and the mantle that's on your life. Pat, I'm telling you, it's far more important than you even understand. Far more important. It goes out across the land. Goes into places that you've never been before. Does things <laughs> that you uh, wouldn't understand. It helps people have more and more and more and more. See, God does things the way he wants to with people that he wants to do it with. And he does it in, in different ways. We're not all the same. God uses different people in different ways. And he's using you in a very unique and special way. So that's why the enemy's fought you like he has. It's not about you. It's he's afraid of what's in you and what God's called you to do. So you just be bold in it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. So um, the, the, the awesome thing about the word of knowledge is there's always a, there's, there's, there's a power gift that's attached to it, either the gift of faith or the, um, the gift of healings or the working of miracles is always attached to uh, the, the prophetic, or excuse me, the word of knowledge. So, so Holly, it's just a simple thing where God has, has revealed this. I didn't know you are having an, that issue or whatever it is. So God's revealing it to you. So it's as good as done. So you just receive the healing power. Amen. And where is your, where Amen. is the liver at on like, what side is it? Do you know where it's even at? The doctors have told you that there's something on it, an ultrasound done. Okay. So where were they putting the ultrasound? Was it like on the, okay. Okay. So, all right. Well, Grandma Pat, can you come over here real quick and just put your hand on her stomach <coughs> area right here on her abdomen area? And I'll put my hand on top of your hand. Father, in Jesus name. We thank you right now. I curse this thing. I command it to loose her body now. I command it to dry up and get off her liver. And Lord, I ask you to give her just a fresh, a, a refreshing of the liver. Restore her liver if it needs to be restored. And Lord, I thank you when the doctors go back to look, this thing will be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for healing miracle right now in Holly's body, Lord. And I thank you that you'll use this right here to show her Father God, that all things are possible to them that believe. As we believe together today, your healing power will go. I curse this growth. I command it to go in Jesus' name. And I thank you for the victory that we have right now. We're free. We're healed. Ooh, shiki. We're loved by the Father right now in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't have to contend or fight for healing, guys. We have it. It's ours. The word Levine means nothing to nobody in here. Okay. It means something to you and you, two people? No, it was, I heard, yeah, no, no, it was just straight Levine. Okay, that's okay. You, what, you? Okay. 
Okay, yeah, I'll pray for him. Just bring it up here after church, and I'll pray, pray with you for that. Okay, all right, amen. Praise God. That's it. Oh, I'll be preaching tonight, and the Lord already told me it's going to be on the great I am. Praise God. So that's going to be good. So if you just want to stay home, go ahead. But if you want to come, you're <laughs> welcome to come. Uh, if you've been having pain in the middle of your, kind of the middle of your back area, your backbone area, uh, just stand up. If you've been having pain in the middle, kind of the middle section of your back, not the low back or way up high by your neck, but right in the middle. Not that I don't, won't pray for that too, but that's just what the Lord put in my heart to pray for right now. Some of you that are believers in healing and laying on of hands, just stand up and go to someone that's standing up right now. Lay your hand on their shoulder or on their arm. Praise God. Hallelujah. We'll just gang up on the devil, amen? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Ora matasanda ra bakumre pishila bo namri pasinda la vakastore vene prianda si ato brete mishia na arevendete. Oh, sanda, there's the anointing right there. Just let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. The river of God, let it flow. The anointing. Ora vakangreshe meshe. It's ministering to your back, but it's doing other things too. Doing other things too. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We receive from you. <laughs> oh, the victory that you bought and paid for. By your stripes, we're healed. Hallelujah. By your stripes, we're healed. The chastisement of our peace and our mind and our soul was upon you. And by your stripes, we are healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Never be the same. Never be the same in Jesus' name. Never be the same. This is a healing hospital. This is a hospital church. This is a church where people get healed, where people get well, where people get blessed. They get their marriage healed. They get their brain healed. They get their body healed. They get their life healed. They get their business healed. We thank you for healing, Lord. We receive the mantle of healing. We receive the ministry of that angel of healing and miracles. And those, yeah, those ambassadors, those emissaries from heaven that come under his, his tutelage and his authority. We receive them working in our midst right now in Jesus' name. The angelic touch, praise God, if need be. We thank you for it, Lord. Hallelujah. And we refuse pain to be in the same room with us. In the name of Jesus. Command it to go. Command it to leave. Stay gone in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We give you praise, Father. Just worship him and thank him for it. There's still a flow coming down from heaven. I can sense it. Just kind of raining on us right now. Falling on us. Just receive it. Whether you can feel it or not, just receive it. Hallelujah. We receive the rain. Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. Hallelujah. Let it rain upon our lives. Let it rain upon the circumstances. Let it rain on our families. Let it rain on the situations. Hallelujah. That need to be changed. Let it rain, let it rain. It'll not be dry bones. It'll not be desert. But it'll be living, breathing, blessing, hallelujah. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. We receive from heaven. We receive from heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it. Thank you for it. Ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-
In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise. <laughs> Do you sense his peace? Isn't that good? That's what heaven's going to be like, only a lot stronger than it is right now. Yes. Oh, we can live there all the time. He's in us, you know. The greater one is in us. Thank you, Jesus. His kingdom is in us. Isn't it good? Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Glory, glory, glory. Well, he's good. You know, every time you think about our church here, just say it's a, it's a hospital. It's a place of healing. Begin to, let's just become one voice together and say, people are drawn here to be healed. People are drawn here to be set free. Just believe with me that the angels are going and they're bringing, they're directing people here. It's time for that to happen. These are glory days. The glory's not near at the level that it will be, but we've got to step into these days. We've got to begin to decree what's happening. And these are glory days. Glory days. Amen. Well, Lord, thank you for what you've done in our midst this morning. Thank you for every person you've touched. Thank you, Lord, that we live in a place of victory all the time in you. And as the people go, Lord, bless them this afternoon. Just give them rest for the week ahead. Thank you for all that you're going to do in our midst tonight. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a good afternoon. Praise God. Be blessed. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord.